How does it feel to call yourself an investment banker? To be perceived as powerful and power hungry? To work through the night on deals between the world's biggest companies? What's it like to be part of an industry blamed, rightly or wrongly, for the financial crisis that rocked the world in 2009? A survey in the UK found that banker comes in as the fifth least trusted profession after politician, journalist, car salesman and tele salesperson. And it seems that this unpopularity has surged in the aftermath of the financial crisis, as normal people the world over felt the effects of banks risk taking, and ultimately ended up bailing out banks that were, as the term was coined, TBTF, too big to fail. And no one really seemed to get in trouble for it. I think that lots of this distrust also comes from the difficulty in conceptualizing what bankers actually do. It comes from a conception that bankers are simply creating wealth for themselves without actually creating anything. Unlike Amazon's Jeff Bezos or Tesla's Elon Musk or Apple's Steve Jobs, no matter how controversial they may have been as personalities, they all created stuff, tangible stuff that people can respect. Their fortunes came from innovations that have changed the way we all live. It's not possible to say the same for bankers. Bankers can expect to earn around $300,000 a year by the time they're 30. So what do they actually do? What does the average day look like for an analyst? That's the bottom rung on the investment banking ladder. What do they actually do? And can the huge sums of money that they earn be justified by what they in fact bring to society? I got in touch with one of my good pals who worked as an investment banking analyst for over a year in London before moving to New York. And she agreed to let me stay with her in New York. And she also agreed to let me grill her on her lifestyle and how she feels being an investment banker. Bankers don't really create anything. I feel like they're kind of just this part of the economy that is somewhat unknown and obviously massively unpopular. Do you feel like that reputation is deserved? And why should you be paid so much rather than teachers, engineers, people who are actually creating stuff? I don't agree with you uh, when you say banks don't create something. I think it's hard to see a tangible product, obviously, because that doesn't exist. Yeah. But the services that banks provide to companies to grow and improve are absolutely vital to the economy growing and working. And right. if it wasn't for banks helping companies raise the capital they need, raise the debt they need, get the loans they need, buy and sell other companies, the economy simply wouldn't move forward. In terms of the cogs of how the economy works, yeah. banks are absolutely integral. If you take away the banking industry, you're left with a lot of companies that will collapse. A startup's progress, um, progression to becoming a very successful company is first attract capital, get investors. Yeah. A startup is not going to grow unless it gets investors to pump money into it. Eventually you might think, okay, actually now I'm ready to be publicly listed. That's going to get a whole new amount of capital for me and that's going to help me grow even more. Banks are there to help that. Yeah. Then maybe they're listed and they'll say, actually, you know, if I acquire this company that's about to go bust, I can turn it around and I will also get much bigger and better. Banks are there to help that. So yeah. banks are there to help companies every stage of the way. Yeah. And if there weren't banks helping do that, there's a lot of aspects of a company's growth that just wouldn't be possible or be very, very yeah. difficult. I think it's hard to visualize exactly what banks are contributing, but if you take a step back and think about it, they're kind of ever present and hugely important. Right. Do you not feel like you're just helping big companies, Amazon or Google, just get bigger and absorb kind of other companies into them rather than anything really innovative happening? Definitely not. Um, right. For example, the company I work for is constantly monitoring startups, constantly helping them grow. Banks help startups connect with each other, attract the capital they need. So yes, of course, um, they do help the bigger companies get bigger, but they also help the smaller companies get bigger. And sometimes smaller companies wouldn't survive if they weren't acquired. It does often look bad because of the fact that maybe they're helping Facebook acquire Instagram or one of these huge transactions. There's also a lot of very small transactions that banks are helping with. It's very hard to argue that a banker deserves more money than a doctor. It's just a result of the fact that these banks want to attract the very best people. And yeah. they can only really do that, especially given the hours, if they offer these incentives. Yeah. And I think if you look at technology companies, they're actually starting to offer similar wages. Yeah. Same as consultancies, same as law firms. Yeah. Now I spent six days with her and I've got to say, I don't think I've ever known someone work so hard, yet view their own life as so, well, normal. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm becoming a corporate lawyer and I'm under no illusions that I'll be working serious hours. But this was next level. 
When most people get up, they grab a bagel on their way to work and get to the office around 9. Not bankers. I think it's a way of life. It's getting up at 6.35, it's heading straight out and being at the gym by 7, enduring a gruelling hour-long treadmill class and expecting to get home after 9.30pm that night. On a pretty good day. She walks to work, answering emails on the way, of course. Time is money, people! And sadly, when I tried to film her entering her work building, the security guards at the office clearly saw me as a considerable threat to important data and stuff, so took my camera off me. So I'll just have to ask her about the rest of her day. So, what do bankers do? So... <laughs> bankers... So there are different types of bankers, but the type of banking that I do, which is classic banking, your role is essentially to help your clients um, achieve their strategic goals. So it could be I want to buy a company, yep. I want to sell a company, I want to buy a division, I want to sell a division. Yep. It could be I want to become public, so a company that's owned by its, just by its owners could decide to list its shares in the stock market, yep. so they would that's called an IPO. They could say I want to get investors in my company. It could also just be we didn't get a very, we didn't have a very good year this year, we didn't make enough profit. How do you think we can improve? What does your job consist of? Like, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? So as an analyst at a bank, you spend a lot of time doing what's called modeling. So you'll have the financials of the company and they'll say to you, I'm look, thinking about acquiring this. How will my financials be affected? And you will basically build an Excel that will have lots of formulas using the different financial metrics of the companies to understand whether it will be beneficial or detrimental to the company to acquire a different company. And the right. metrics you normally would look at is, is it going to increase their profit? Of course it will increase their profit because they'll acquire the profit of the company they're buying, but is it worth the amount they're going to spend to buy it? Is right. mainly the question that you're asking. So yeah. is the money that you're going to spend to buy this company worth it? And okay. why? And in simple terms, how are you working that out? Like, because I mean, so it's very scientific in the way you're doing that, right? Yeah. It is. So to give you an example, yeah. one of the main metrics that investors look at when they're assessing how well a company's doing and therefore they're to invest yeah. is what's called earnings per share or EPS. Yeah. Um, to break that down, let's say a company has 100 shares and it's making $1,000 of profit. That means for every share it's making $10 of profit. Therefore they have $10 earnings per share. The company wants that to be as high as possible. So when they're looking to buy another company, they'll say to you, is this going to make my EPS higher or lower? Right, okay. And you'll work that out. In an average day, how long would you spend doing each of the different tasks that you have to do? Okay. So it really does depend on what you're working on. So there's two different types of um, projects you're working on if you're a banker. So one is a live, what we call live transaction. That's where a company is actually in the process of acquiring another and you're working on that deal. Yeah. Then you can also be working on what's called client servicing, and that's just when you have a client, they're asking you questions, and you're doing theoretical analysis. Right. So when you're working on a deal, that transforms your work. A lot of it will be interaction with the client, so interaction yeah. with the CEO, interaction with the other side. You'll be helping with the logistics of the transaction, whether that's setting up meetings or helping the companies ask questions on each other, etc. So that yeah. could end up being five or six hours of your day. Another thing that might happen is the company could say to you, can you do some analysis on how it would affect the transaction if I you know, acquired debt to finance it, for example. Right, okay. So then you would probably spend three or four hours in Excel working with your team to figure out the correct mass and the correct way to approach that. Yeah. Then you'd also probably spend three or four hours putting that into PowerPoint and formatting. It. Right, okay. Who tells you what you have to do and who do you tell what to do? So it, it varies obviously by your seniority and by yeah. the company, but generally the way banking is structured is you work in teams of let's say four or five or six people. So you'll have um, someone at the top could be what's called a managing director or an executive director. Then you'll have a vice president, then you'll have an associate, then you'll have an analyst. Yeah. So as an analyst, you don't really have anyone reporting to you. You're the one that does all you know all the basic work. Then you will send that work to your associate's review. Your associate will give you comments. Then you'll implement those comments. When the associate is happy, you'll send it to your VP. The same process again happens. Yeah. And then finally, it gets to the most senior person on the team. And he's the one who obviously has the most insight into the client and the relationship and what yeah. the client's looking for. So he will then ultimately decide if anything needs to change or whether it's ready to go. Right, so pretty much every kind of piece of work will be structured in that hierarchical yeah, way. Yeah, it's, it's pretty structured. Okay, we'll talk about lifestyle stuff now. What's a good night's sleep for you? And how often do you get that? 
Um, <laughs> I would say in your analyst years, yeah. it's, it can be tough. It does depend, it, it varies what, wildly by what industry you cover, where you work, how your team functions, yeah. but it could be that you're not getting very much sleep. Can you give a figure, like what, what would be like, a, I've had a decent night's sleep for you? I would say seven hours and I'm very happy. Okay. Seven hours. But I think as an analyst, I was often sleeping far less than that. Yeah. Um, I think as you do get more senior, it does help a lot because you then have people working for you who are then pulling those hours and yeah. you, you know, you, you do get a bit more time. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a bit of a trade off because the more senior you get, the more responsibilities you have. So the more stressful it is, but then you might not have to put in as many hours. Yeah. But on the flip side of that, because you put in so many hours, you learn so much in such a short space of time. And yeah. you'll find that if you compare yourself to other people at your level in other industries, you've probably learned a lot more just from the sheer volume of hours you put yeah, in. Yeah, just because you're putting in just way more hours exactly. than they are. Would you say you're very happy with the decision you made to go into banking? Definitely. So two things, and one is quite obvious, like I've learned a lot. Um, I'm, I would say, quite a very different person than I was when I began. Yeah. I'm just much more mature. I know much more about the world of finance, but also generally the business world as a whole. Yeah. But secondly, and almost more importantly, you end up in an environment of very driven, very clever, very hardworking people. Yeah. You'll find that you'll make amazing relationships, amazing friendships with exactly the kind of people you want to be surrounded by. Yeah. Um, especially in Europe, you'll find that banks can often be very international. Yeah. So like I made a friendship group at my bank where you know, I had 10 friends from 10 different countries. Yeah, yeah. That's an incredible experience to have yeah. as a young person and I think Often your 20 something years are defined by the people you spend them with and yeah. by being in an industry like banking, you really are surrounding yourself with people who are doing the best to be all they can be and yeah. that puts you in a good position and yeah. in the right frame of mind. Yeah. If you feel like you learned something in this video, go watch my video about life as a corporate lawyer. I ask whether real life lawyers are like Harvey Specter and follow a corporate lawyer around for a day at one of the world's biggest law firms.